This is a bit of biology with Mr. Rock, and today we are going to be talking about Mendelian genetics. So where did we get the name Mendelian genetics from? It actually came from the father of genetics, and if you have not heard of this guy before, I'd actually be impressed, but a man named Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk. Uh, that lived during the 1800s, and what he did, he spent most of his life studying pea plants. He was very fascinated with science, very fascinated with inheritance, and he studied pea plants extensively and essentially gave us some of the laws for genetics. So he was from Austria, which is in Europe, uh, kind of near Germany. And two things I would want to point out is his findings, Gregor Mendel's findings, was, n was not discovered or talked about until the mid-1900s. And that's mainly because when he was learning about pea plants, Darwin was saying that humans came from monkeys. So I guess Darwin had kind of had the more exciting idea at the time. Uh, and then another thing that I'd like to point out is Gregor Mendel knew and understood so much about genetics for also not understanding anything about DNA. He doesn't learn, we don't know anything about DNA until the early 1900s. So what he learned was really impressive being that he didn't even know what DNA is. So first question that students always ask, why pea plants? Why did he spend so much seven years of his life completely devoted to over 28,000 pea plants. Why pea plants? I think, personally for you, you could probably think of a few reasons, but if you're thinking of studying heredity, inheritance over a long period of time, what is going to be useful? Number one, pea plants are super cheap, and that's an actual consideration for what organism you're going to choose when studying genetics. Pea plants can grow in a small area, uh, Gregor Mendel lived in a monastery, so it's not like he had a whole lot of room to be working with. He didn't have his own zoo where he could conduct his own experiments. He only had a little plot of land to do his studies. They produce a lot of offspring in a short amount of time. So choosing pea plants where they can create offspring in under a month is a really helpful advantage, as opposed to choosing humans where it takes us, you know, 13 to... 20 years to reproduce. So pea plants can do it very, very quickly. Two things here, self-pollination and artificially pollinate. So pollinate in plant world means have sex. So Mendel was able to artificially pollinate these plants. So what that means is he could take the pollen and put it on specific plants that he wants. This is easier to do than making cats or making mice um, reproduce. So he was essentially like making them have offspring, making them have sex. And then also plants can self-pollinate. So that means they can also reproduce just with themselves because they both have the sperm and egg. And finally, they have easily observable traits. So what that means is Mendel was looking at these pea plants and he saw traits that can easily be observed and recorded. So he saw the seed color and the seed color could either be yellow or green and that was a very obvious trait. Seed shape either being round or wrinkled. The flower of the pea plant either being purple or white. The pod color either being green or yellow. So all of these traits were easily observable and this is a lot easier than studying maybe blood type in humans, where you can't see what a human's blood type is. Or this is easier than studying bacteria that are microscopic. So easily observable traits was a huge feature of his study. So getting into his actual experiment, what he initially did, he looked at all of these traits, and we're going to just start off with yellow peas versus green peas. Yellow is dominant to green. And he took two purebred homozygous pea plants. So he took big Y, big Y, so yellow peas, and he crossed them with green peas. And what he saw in the offspring was all yellow pea plants. Just to help us out with some of this language, we are going to call from here on out in this genetics unit, the first generation is going to be the parental generation, and we will also call that the P1. 
So the two homozygous parents, homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, are the P1 generation, and they give rise to the F1 generation. The F1 generation is just all the offspring from the P1 generation. So we're just going to use this language so we can easily identify different generations. So although he didn't know at the time, this is what he was seeing with his Punnett squares. So he took two homozygous, one homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive. As you go through, you do big Y, big Y, and cross it with little y, little y. What he saw in the results were all yellow P. And then what that turned out to be was 100%. So 100% of the offspring was yellow, and it was also heterozygous. Now this next step in the experiment is where he learns quite a bit, because what he does is he takes two individuals from the F1 generation, yes, so they are kind of brother and sister, and I know that's a little weird, but they're few parents, so it's fine. Uh, he takes big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y, so two heterozygous individuals, and he crosses them into the F2 generation. Let me jump back real quick, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the F2 generation. So F1's offspring is called the F2. He crosses them, he, the Punnett square unfolds. So we do big Y cross with little y, big Y cross with little y. And what he sees, and this is the big part, is he sees a true three to one ratio. So he saw three yellow P plants for every one green. And this resulted in 75% of the pea plants being yellow and 25% of them being green. So this was a huge finding. And remember, like he didn't know a whole lot about DNA and genotypes and phenotypes. Like a lot of this language is new and he was just observing. So he saw consistently three to one ratios. He did this with the pea color. So he saw yellow and green peas, but then also this is his actual data table from his studies, and he studied over, like I said, around 28,000 different pea plants, and what he consistently saw when he did these traits, when he crossed two heterozygous, so this was a heterozygous generation, and he crossed two heterozygous, he consistently saw the 3 to 1 ratio, the 3 to 1 ratio. He saw it in the seed form, round versus wrinkled. He saw it in the pod form. He saw it in the pod color. He saw it in the flower color. He kept on seeing this three to one ratio, and that really stuck out to him, and it led him to develop three major laws of genetics. The first major law of genetics that he learned was that there is a law of dominance. So there are three laws of inheritance that Mendel learned. The first one is the law of dominance. This states that when two different alleles, so a big Y and a little y, are together, only one form of that trait will be expressed. So when you get big Y and little y, so pretty much when you get a heterozygous individual, only one form of the trait will be expressed. This is a big uh, caveat or one thing that I just want to say about Mendelian genetics. Mendelian genetics is intro genetics. It is also very, very simplified. So if you're in your head, you're thinking right now, well, skin color, if somebody with darker skin, you know, has offspring with somebody with lighter skin, it's actually blended, so it's not dominant. We are going to get to the more advanced genetics later on in this unit, but this is just what we're starting off with. So Mendelian genetics can sometimes be simple genetics, but it still holds true for many of our traits. The second law of inheritance that he learned about was that the law of segregation, and he learned this uh, pretty much what meiosis was, the creation of sperm and egg. So it states that during the formation of gametes, the two alleles responsible for a trait separate from one another. What this pretty much means is that you got one trait from your mom and one trait from your dad, and this is like, you could think of Widow's Peak. Maybe your dad gave you the allele for Widow's Peak and your mom didn't. So you get one allele from mom and one allele from dad. The law of segregation states that you are only going to pass on one allele to your offspring. So you could think of this like a coin flip 
every single time you create sex cells, it is a coin flip with your traits. You are either going to give them mom's allele or dad's allele. It is either going to be heads or tails, but it cannot be both. And finally, the last law is the law of independent assortment. What this pretty much means is the alleles for different traits are distributed to sex cells and offspring independently of one another. What this means, uh, to give you an example, is just because you have widow's peak does not mean that you are going to be left-handed. Or just because you're left-handed doesn't mean you have freckles. The alleles separate independently from one another. So just because a pea plant is yellow does not mean it is going to be short. All the alleles separate independently. They do not depend on one another. So just because you have freckles doesn't mean that you're going to have widow's peak. In the coin flip example, this would be like me flipping a penny to determine if you have widow's peak. So heads, maybe you get, give your mom's allele, tails, you give your dad's allele. Independent assortment is flipping a quarter to determine if you get freckles. So the two coins do not depend on one another. Just because you got heads with one flip does not mean you're going to get tails in the other flip. That is all I have for you today. This has been a bit of biology with Mr. Rock. I'm signing off.